In the Idaho 4 Koberger case, a lot of people say, oh, there are docs. Well, we don't just have the docs. We have some really interesting connections that we have found. And we have a forensics expert to help us out. Today, we're going to be looking at some TikTok documents. I'm Lainey Law. And I'm attorney Andrew Myers. Today, we have Forensic Frenzy joining us. Forensic, how are you doing today? Great. How are you? You're doing good. Thank you so much. Forensic has put together a PowerPoint that we're going to go through and we're going to look at some documents. Okay. So today, I wanted to bring to About the Law, TikTok, TikTok. I will also show this episode um a version of my own on my show as well so you'll see this in two places you'll get multiple different versions of it and opinions on it um we will go through three TikTok warrants pertaining to the victims who were in the home that night the survivors who were in the home that night and the defendant so let's see what we get when we look into the TikTok warrants go ahead so warrant number one was for Maddie, Kaylee, and Zana. So our first search warrant was for Maddie Mogan. She has a Gmail address as well as a telephone number that ends in 1224. And all that's been redacted, obviously, right? Yes. Okay. I'm shocked that they would even include what the number ends in. I, you know, it's good that they got rid of the email address, but something that I want our viewers to be wary of is that with someone's full name, you're able to find their address and you could kind of crawl for it. Like you could see, I'm not going to give out too much information, but with the last four digits of the phone number, that's a lot of information to even give. I agree. I agree. Um, and the last four digits of the phone number were redacted on the cell phone warrants, um, but on other warrants, they weren't. Um, things that you would typically use your phone number to sign up um, for like apps and stuff like that. So right. mm -hmm. um, they were also looking for Kaylee Gonsalves. Um, she did have a phone number as well, listed ending in 4818, as well as two email addresses, a Yahoo email address, as well as a Gmail email address. Zana okay. Kernodal with a Gmail address, as well as her telephone number ending in 1278. The time span for this warrant was from December 13th of 2022, reaching back to January 1st of the prior year, 2021. Some of the things that this warrant looked for, well, actually, we're going to read all of them. All of the things that this warrant looked for are things like identity and contact information. So full name, email address, physical address, city, state, zip, date of birth, phone numbers, gender, hometown, occupation, and other personal identifiers. Let me just stop you right there because, I mean, as you know, I'm one of the biggest proponents for making a lot of stuff public, but that right there is the triad of identity from which anybody could steal an identity and get their own credit cards and bank accounts. So, I mean, I hate to say I do see a reason why this stuff was, uh, the responses redacted. to this was uh, redacted. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I just I agree with you. It's a lot of personal identity, and I think that a lot of people right now, TikTok is in the forefront of their minds because a lot of people are like, oh, TikTok's stealing information of us. We got to cancel TikTok in six months if they don't sell, you know. So TikTok is kind of notorious for having a lot of information about people. And about us. Mm -hmm. I agree. Totally agree. B, all past and current usernames associated with the account. Now, Lainey, Yesterday, when Andrew and I had tried to do this, we had talked about this. All past and current usernames associated with the account. So if I ever changed my handle or my, mm -hmm. you know, the way that you find me or look mm -hmm. me up, whatever I'm identified as on TikTok, right. if that's what you would agree that they're looking for here. Yep. 
it Absolutely. would be. The history has a lot of information pertaining to it as well as because you might consider that someone might have a handle initially and then change it to something else. That new handle that they might have might not be used for similar accounts, but say that phone had a handle that was like some guy 42. Maybe that's all the instances of some guy 42 on that phone. But maybe if you go on the internet and you try to search that handle, you might find a lot more accounts that you didn't realize that they might have had. So the fact that it's the present versus the past also is a significant amount of information. Okay. C. The dates <clears throat> and times at which the account and profile were created and the internet protocol or IP address at the time of their sign up. So when they signed up, where were they located by internet protocol address? What was the date and the time? That's what I get from that. Mm -hmm. Yep. All activity logs, including IP logs and other documents showing the IP address, date and time of each login to the account as well as any other log file information. So this tells me that so since we log into things sometimes and we stay logged in for a really long time, they just want to know when there were logins, mm -hmm. when were they? Um, where there have been logins that perhaps occurred while other logins existed, multiple device logins, overlap, stuff like that. So they're digging to find any of those things where I didn't just log in, but in, you know, where I was at that time, but like, you know, if I was logged into other, so say I was logged in on my phone in my iPad. Right. Mm -hmm. um, all For information some people to kind of, sorry to interrupt, but to explain this to people watching at home who might not understand, like the IP of your phone is going to be different from your iPad and the IP, like when you log in, say, for um, uh, incognito mode, sometimes it might be like, oh, we sent you a code to confirm because it's trying to track all these different locations that's going on and comparing where they signed up to the different logins can kind of tell you if anybody else had that account information or where that person timeline was and why they were doing it on different devices. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, all information regarding the particular device or devices used to log in to or access the account, including all device identifier information or cookie information, including all information about the particular device or devices used to access the account and the date and time of those accesses. So there was a lot there. Mm -hmm. um, and Cookie information is a lot. Yeah. And then each device, like they, I mean, they say it very, with a, like a mouthful of words, but each device does have its own cookie information. So if they're logged in on their iPad and their phone, they want the cookie information from both. So they're just, it's a very wordy way of saying that, but they're just saying that they want, um, All the information like IMEI and stuff like that for the, or however you put that, because I know not everything is um, runs off an IMEI, but they want all of that information to be able to determine specifics about the devices that were accessing the TikToks. All right. And your cookies also might contain information for like if you're ever searching for something and then you go on like Facebook or TikTok and you're getting an ad for it, that's a result of the cookies. So the cookies are a way to kind of profile you as you use the internet. Some a lot of security reasons say to clear your cookies, but a lot of people often don't clear their cookies. So your phone may have a very long backlog of information about you that you don't even realize. I was telling forensic earlier about the lady down the street that used to make oatmeal cookies for my mother. Oh, I love That's oatmeal cookies. About, right? <laughs> I love oatmeal cookies. <laughs> Those are my favorite. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Good taste. <laughs> yeah. On, only though. You're trying to so, be serious and here I am being a fool. I'm sorry. So we're going to need to go to hit up that person down the street. <laughs> I don't have a person down the street. <laughs> we'll mail them. <laughs> Too bad. 
I'm so protecting you... her identity. I'm going to protect your identity. <laughs> so to play off what Lainey was saying um, about the cookies, let me just put it into like a YouTube perspective for our YouTube viewers. So basically when you're watching your ads um, that run in someone's YouTube show, those are actually specifically tailored to like your region, your searches and stuff like that. And it's because of cookies. Yep. Like yep. it's not just, you know, where you are and what's available around you. It's because of the things that they find that you've been looking for in your phone history and your It cookies. tells a lot about you. A lot of yes. personal information about you. I mean, if you're uh, if you're uh, just a stupid example, I was uh, shopping for office printers, and for months after I bought the new printers for the office, I was getting ads for uh, Mr. Myers. Do you want to buy an office printer? No, 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 I don't. But, I mean, <laughs> that's a benign example. You might have been shopping for a lot of other stuff, like I'm not going to mention a K-bar knife or anything like that. But dun dun dun. <laughs> the cookies would show that. Yes. Okay, let's see. Oh, all data and information associated with the profile page. So the main screen that you visit when you see the person's profile on TikTok. So um, it would have their bio, um, their background, their themes, their profile picture, that stuff. All communications <clears throat> and other messages sent or received by the account. So if someone is DMing someone and maybe someone's not responding back, we'll know that. If they're having an open dialogue conversation where it's going back and forth, we'll know that too. All user created, I'm sorry, all user content created, uploaded or shared by the account. So any postings, any um, reels, stories, I don't really use TikTok, but I don't know if they use those words there, but that's that's what I'm going for. Same energy. Um, <laughs> including any comments made by um, the account on photographs or other content. So if I ever commented on your photo and said, um, queen, for example, mm -hmm. as we've heard someone may have done that night, that would also be in this TikTok more. Mm. Um, all photographs and images in the user gallery for the account. So um, any photos that I took that are even in the TikTok camera roll, rather I posted them or not, if it was ever taken and saved there. All right. That's what they're looking for. Um, <laughs> All location data associated with the account, including geo tags. Um, all data and information that has been deleted by the user. So if I ever posted anything and then reluctantly or remorsefully took it down. Um, Interesting. A list of all people that the user follows, as well as the people who follow the user, following list and followers list, as well as any friends of the user a list of all users that the account has unfollowed or blocked. All privacy and account settings. So rather, um, we talked about this yesterday as well, Andrew, um, rather or not I have, yep. you know, like where you can just see all my stuff on Instagram or if you have to ask me, hey, can I look at your stuff on Instagram? Right. That's what they're looking for there. Um, and then searches that were saved by the account. All information about <clears throat> connections between the account and third party websites or applications. So let me put that into terms for YouTubers as well. What I get from this is that when you visit my YouTube, but then you click the link to go to my website, that's the third party information. Oh, uh, okay. They want to know that you got to my website through YouTube. They want to know how you landed on me. Did you directly come to me? Um, did you literally just go to forensicfrenzy.com or did you go to Forensic Frenzy's YouTube and then her website and then her Instagram? And then you built upon those, you know, and that it would draw a different picture. Um, but also it would tell them um, who I trusted, like as far as third parties go with my TikTok information. So mm -hmm. for example, if I signed up for my TikTok using my Google Gmail, that's mm -hmm. kind of, it makes more sense in that 
sense to me as well, that they want all third parties that have anything to do with my TikTok information. All right. All records pertaining to communications between TikTok and any person regarding the user or user's TikTok account, including contacts with support services, and all records of actions taken, including suspensions of the account. And then they go on to tell you, obviously, the standard um, of why and how long they have to abide by the search warrant. And it was signed at 426 p.m. on December 13th, 2022. Exactly one, exactly one month after the uh, crime. One month after the crimes, mm -hmm. the TikTok warrant went out. <clears throat> And we know tick that Xana may have been on TikTok at 412. So yeah. a month later, they may have just been realizing that and put the TikTok warrant out. Or um, maybe they did, did already know that earlier on. And um, maybe it's they just wanted a, to confirm it. Yeah. Yeah. Like a coincidental thing that they sure. just needed to confirm. Yeah. TikTok um, but, also so has really important information in the sense that TikTok can tell if someone has your number, even if you don't have their number. That's one of the scarier aspects of TikTok, but I think something that might be helpful in this case, we don't know, we don't know what's going to happen with this case, but say if someone had one of the victim's phone numbers and not the victim didn't necessarily know that, TikTok usually connects that. So like, say if I have a TikTok account, if I have someone's number in my phone, TikTok's going to find that person's account, even if I haven't shared my contacts, which I haven't shared my contact with TikTok, but it will still show me people that either have my phone number or I have their phone number. And I have everyone in my neighborhood following me on TikTok now against my will. So <laughs> it is very, it has a lot of information that you don't necessarily give it. And that isn't necessarily transparent on Instagram. You can't see if someone has your phone number, but TikTok will tell you. Yeah, I did notice that. So I don't use TikTok, but I have one just so that I can look up things for like true crime cases. Mm -hmm. And when I first signed up for the TikTok, I noted that it knew an awful lot of people, um, it, like even knew their actual phone numbers and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I, I, and I was like, oh my God, do they know that about me? Are they offering that about me to people? Not like, so yeah. They I'm are. Very, and it's crazy to the point where if you send the link to someone on TikTok, it'll trade, it'll be like, oh, this person sent you this link. Do you want to follow them? It's crazy. See, in a way it's not bad because, uh, you know, 12, 14 years ago when I was working with an SEO person for my office, that was a good thing because, you know, I'm an attorney, you know, we thrive on new business. So that's a good thing. I want people to have my number. But if you're a private individual, there are a million reasons why you don't want people to have all that information. Yeah. So yeah. I think I think it was geared for business people like me. But now people are using it for personal stuff, which is dangerous. Yeah. yeah. Very scary right, stuff. So I think our next one's going to be a... Okay, so to this search warrant, on the 23rd of December, there was a extension, an extension. So the 13th of December, just want to go over a couple of um, coincidences with this document. The 13th of December, the defendant's license plate was picked up on the license plate reader in Loma, Colorado. Coincidental or not, this warrant was also then signed. Now, when they realize that they're going to have to extend this warrant on the 23rd, um, they get the cast. Coincident or not, they get the cast. Um, in a lot of versions of the story, around the 15th or so of December, if not sometime before that, which I think it was well before that, but it's usually the very latest, mid-December, that people believe law enforcement was on to Brian Koberger. If that's true, then maybe mid-December to the 23rd makes sense um, for cast. But if they were on to him as early as I think they were, 
Um, and they were like looking for his number on the tower dump and um, following his phone to determine his whereabouts for that night and stuff like that. Um, or they wanted to. I'm not sure why they wouldn't have sought out Cast sooner. But ironically, well, now wait a minute. You, you talk about them uh, getting on to Brian Koberger in mid December. According to the probable cause affidavit, two different police officers, I believe they were um, Washington State uh, University officers, were on. At least they found the um, Elantra outside of his apartment and identified it with uh, Brian Koberger uh, at the end of November. Remember that from the PCA? Correct. So, maybe they weren't on to him. Maybe it was just a lead that they found and they didn't follow up with it. That's always been a question in my mind. I believe that could possibly be the case. That's kind of something that I was trying to say just now, because it just seems I'm a sorry. little weird. <laughs> yeah. No, it's okay. It just seems a little weird that they took so long to yeah. look into yeah. it. I mean, the whole time they were being told that there may be a stalker. Um, and then they look into his cast historical data and they're like, well, we think he was the stalker. Well, right. Then why did it take you so long to take a look into, obviously you didn't think he would, you know, so, and I say that, you know, just trying to be as open as possible. Obviously you didn't think he was the stalker because it took you over a month to, well, nearly a month to actually be interested in the 12 times apparently that he was there before. So. Right. Crazy. So then we'll go back and take another look super quick. December 13th, obtained and served the warrant for TikTok for Maddie, Kaylee, and Zana. It did not return from the extension that we just seen on the 23rd of December. It did not actually return until February 19th of 2023. However, the next day, it was downloaded and stowed away into inventory. And as you can see at the very bottom there, December 22nd, 2023 is when this was actually um, signed, this document. So again, they show you what they were looking for, the three telephone numbers, as well as um, four different emails, two of which belonged to Kaylee. And then it just says here on this page, just in case, because I am actually um, tracking this. So I guess this is just a gem. Um, for our audiences, I am actually tracking this, the time. Okay. So don't just pay attention to the date, pay attention to the time because um, you want to know the chain, the order of the links in the chain. Um, mm -hmm. so it doesn't just help to know that all these different things happened on November 29th. It actually helps to know that what happened on November 29th starts with the two WSU officers who found Brian Zalantra. Right. And then the cars get towed. And then Kaylee's phone warrant comes back. And then the prosecutor makes some really weird statements that the next day law enforcement is going to say, strike that. So it really, um, knowing the time is, is, it's a huge piece of the puzzle um, okay. as far as putting together <clears throat> how things, you know, actually did occur. Not just what occurred on the same day, but how things actually went and flowed. So at 4 p.m. on the 22nd of February, and they submitted this document. All right. The reason why everything is sealed. So all three warrants have the same information covered in them. Um, they sought out the same thing, no matter who they were looking for, the warrant for. They are all sealed for the exact same reasons, and we will read them. One, as not to interfere with enforcement proceedings. Two, or deprive a person of a right to a fair trial. Three, constitute an unwarranted invasion of personal privacy. Four, dis disclose the identity of a confidential source and or disclose investigative techniques and procedures. So- Can I add number six? Can I add number six? Yep, you may. So people don't see that we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, I do. So, so they give you, no, 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 I love it. So they give you these 
five little things that they've got going on. So that's like literally saying it could be all of these things. It could be one or two of these things. So when it comes down to like deprive a person the right to a fair trial, maybe, but could also just be disclose the identity of a confidential source or disclose investigative right. techniques and procedures. Right. It could be all five. It could be any of the ones that you'd like to right. choose or just one. Maybe they're simply just trying to hide the identity of a confidential source. Or, or it might be none of the above and a smoke screen. It might just be, you know, Correct. we don't we don't want to tell you. So there. Correct. I agree. Okay. So let's I'm sorry I'm such a cynic, but <laughs> that's I've legal uh professional. I've been, this, I've been following this stuff for a long time, so excuse my cynicism. <laughs> Go ahead. No, nope. he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> so that document was submitted on the 22nd of February, 2023. And yep. then on the 25th of February, there was an order to seal the search warrant. So we move forth and see that it was finally ordered to be sealed and redacted. Um, yep. And then eventually entered into the I court portal. On March 24th of 2023, and this is amidst the Richard Batanti, um, Bethany Funk, yes. exculpatory evidence, um, the Brady Giglio. Yep. Um, this is so the document for Brady Giglio didn't go into the I court portal until the 27th of March. But if right. you actually check out the document, it's dated for the 24th. So these two things actually happened on the same day. Um, just another coincidence, maybe, or maybe not. Yep. So again, that warrant for Maddie, Kaylee, and Zana was obtained on December 13th. Um, ironically, the day that law enforcement seems to, as they will tell us one day, I'm sure, they're going to say that he went on the run that day. So coincidence or not, there was an extension 10 days later because they only had 10 days to get the warrant back. Right. Um, it was returned on February 19th, downloaded the next day. Two days later, there was a motion to seal. Three days later, there was an order to seal. And then there was an order to seal and redact the warrant on March 24th of 2023. Okay. Warrant number two pertains to the defendant. Brian and Colbert. this warrant went out, correct, and this warrant went out um, 20 days after he was extradited back to Idaho, right. okay? So, as you can see here, it does say the TikTok account of Brian Koberger, which confirms for us that they did find a TikTok account for Brian Koberger, okay? Which is crazy. Email dude. addresses. Now, this one, yes, it is. Now, this one, I wanted to um, highlight the blanks because I wanted us to see how many there were. Um, he has one, two, three email addresses, as well as a phone number, and then obviously an IMEI number that would go with the phone number and possibly the email addresses as well. They were looking for the same information that they wanted in the previous TikTok warrant. Go ahead, Andrew. No, that's just really interesting because we know that he has uh, degrees and he's studying, you know, forensics and he's studying uh, criminology and wasn't his specialty, you know, cloud um, stuff. And so, yeah, it makes a lot of sense that he had multiple emails and phones and everything else. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. at least if I had to guess, which if he only has these three, he's got nothing on my psychotic self with my like seven different email pluses. But if I had to guess, there's an EDU email, there's a personal email, and at least a junk email, if not more. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Or I would say that um, he may, because, so I never really lost access to my email address from when I went to college the first time, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, so he could still have like his DeSales one. He could have like his Washington one, um, because as a TA, I'm sure not just a student, but he has to have an email address. Um, and then like, you know, like his personal one, but also like, think about if you're the kind of person who like can remember the email addresses that you've had in the past, like I can still get into my MySpace. 
I know that makes me really, really I old. Them. Very good. But I can get into I write my them mind. all down. Andrew! I, I write them all down. They can't read it, but the Yes, lady... they can. I can read it. <laughs> I write them all down. I could never remember them. Yeah. So there's, you know, you just, you have so many. And he does. They found three at minimum. One phone number. And it looks like one IMEI number. So... From June 1st, which is approximately about the time that they believe he moved out there, um, to present, which again was mm -hmm. January 25th of 2023. So a few weeks after um, he was arrested. Again, just showing that this is all the same information from the previous warrant. Right. Now this one, right. as you can see, again, 1032 AM at the bottom on December, or I'm sorry, January 25th of 2023. Come in, babe. Yeah, January 25th uh, at 10.32 in the morning. Correct. Okay. Now, oh, young man. No, thank you. <laughs> now, on this one, the fun thing here is just that the order for the extension um, was ordered on the 8th of February, but it was ordered. I wanted to actually talk to you about this, Andrew. Why is that? This is the new, this, the April 28th. That's the date for all the new proton documents. That's the day that they should have been submitted. So oh, I just right. wanted to give everyone that as well. Um, Cause we're talking about things that may or may not have been a coincidence. And at this point, this one's a little confusing to me. TikTok is a big corporation. They have a bunch of different offices and, you know, there's all kinds of allegations of, you know, what they do over in China. Nonetheless, uh, just because they sent this stuff out uh, early in the year doesn't mean that they'd be able to retain it. And it's quite a possibility because when we send out a subpoena, often the people call us and say, Attorney Myers it's going to take us some time because this is behind 14 different paywalls and securities. And the, and maybe the guy that does this, it might be a big company, but there might be one guy and he's in for surgery and we have to, so there's all kinds of reasons why, you know, often when we send out a subpoena or a search warrant, people call us and tell us, you know, we're happy to comply, but you got to give us more time. And so we say, sure. And we grant an extension. So that could be one, there might not be anything sinister in that it took so long. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And it, I don't know. Um, I don't think it actually took until the 28th of no. April. Nope. Here we go. So, again, the 25th, the warrant for Brian's uh, TikTok was obtained. And the very next day it was served. Now, on March 31st, um, almost a month before the deadline for the extension, it was, in fact, returned. And just a few days later, um, it was opened. So I did check this out and I believe it was returned um, like on a Friday and opened on like a, a Monday or Tuesday. Um, so just there are a few days there, but I don't think it was anything sinister or suspicious. Okay. So a lot of blank information, but from reading the search warrant first, we do know what the blank information is. It's his IMEI number, his phone number, and his three emails. I didn't know anybody still even used whiteout except for me. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I'm so, a big whiteout fan. Show. Yeah, me too. Like, yeah, white out use them. All my like, pens are colored. My like, highlighters are colored. Color. I got the whiteout on deck. Yeah. Oh, you guys should see the colorful timeline I have built on my wall and my, <laughs> oh, my fiance. But anyway, so, so as you can see here, um, this one was just signed into the court um, on the 6th. So the document was downloaded on the 3rd. They mm -hmm. took it straight to the court on the 6th um, mm -hmm. and they had it signed in. This is an order temporarily sealing that search warrant and its related items. Again, this was one of those documents that was ordered to be sealed and redacted. Um, no proton from May 31st, and it was back, actually supposed to be backdated um, for the 28th of April. Right. So that brings us to our final warrant, which came um, 
in the form of the TikTok information pertaining to the two surviving uh, witnesses and the male victim, Ethan Chapin, which I thought was a little strange um, because they had gone through the girls' TikToks months ago, back in right. December. Yeah. And so why'd they wait so long? Victim. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why did they wait so long mm -hmm. for Ethan? That's very odd. Um, and then even for the survivors, um, they survived. Why would you not check their TikTok? You know, it, maybe there's something on there that would be helpful to, I hate to say this, to figuring out how or why they did survive. You know, I, right. why would you wait so long? Um, it seems like rather you wanted to negate the girls or include the girls or whatever. It does seem like they would have been a part of an initial warrant that would have gone out, I think, um, back in December with the other three female victims. Right. But I actually think all of the warrants should have gone out before that. Um, right. Just, so I'm now using, um, Zana was likely awake and on TikTok at 4.12 a.m. And I'm trying to figure out when they would have figured out that information. How did they you, figure that out? On when TikTok, it will show when people's online. So you could even, you can turn that off, but a friend could theoretically even know that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So another thing that I was thinking is that um, maybe some other form, like her forensic download from her phone, like her overall Apple device, Maybe that was able to tell them that she may have been on TikTok at 4, 12 a.m. And they just didn't know for sure yet. I say that to you, Lainey, because we just saw that their TikTok warrant was sealed or I'm sorry, was extended on the 23rd of December. Well, six days later, it hasn't come back yet. And they use Xana being on TikTok at 4, 12 a.m. Right. in their for the PCA. PCA. Right. How do you know that if the warrant hasn't come back yet? So I'm leaning toward um, they got some information off of Xana's forensic download from her right. Apple phone. Right, right. So let's get into this warrant for um, DMBF and Ethan Chapin. So again, just right at the bottom, you can see what the warrant was looking for. Um, and there is some discrepancy here. So let's talk about it a little. So they are looking for Ethan Chapin's TikTok account. Um, it right. looks like he has one email address, one phone number, like a normal person, not me. But <laughs> between me. June, yeah, yeah, between June first and November fourteenth, um, so the day following the attack. Now, when it came to Dylan and Bethany, um, both one email address. Uh, I'm sorry, both um, one phone number. Dylan did have two email addresses. Bethany um, also had two email addresses. So they were looking for this information pertaining to their two email addresses and their phone numbers from June 1st to the present because they're, they're the survivors. So they were looking for anything beyond the night of the attacks on their devices, right. um, their TikTok. So that's a discrepancy there, but that is why, um, because they actually survived. So they were looking beyond just that night. Um, again, all the same information. And this is the 24th of July, 2023, um, right. 1053 PM, 1053 PM. PM. They're working late nights. <laughs> Just wanted to point that out. Yeah. It had now, to get in before a Apparently. Now, coincidence or not, we're going to back to bring this back around to something else because yep. July 24th is the day that Brian went into court and gave everyone his alibi. And then that night that he was driving around. Late. Yeah. What? And then that night they're working late to get this yeah. TikTok warrant. Interesting. The same night that he gives us his crappy alibi. At 10.53 p.m., they put in a TikTok warrant for Dylan, Bethany, and Ethan. So there was an order for an extension to that TikTok warrant. 
It happened on August 7th of 2023. Now, in between July 24th and August 7th, we heard from the defense um, a little bit. It wasn't technically supposed to be an additive to the to the alibi, but we right. got a little bit more from her. Um, so it was just a few days before this that Ann Taylor had given us some more information. And then the extension, they met the search warrant met its deadline. They did file a nice extension, but this search warrant's going to come back before its extension date on September 4th. Mm -hmm. And in fact, on the 17th, Lawrence Mowry is going to receive an email directing him to the download but he doesn't open it right away. But when he does on the 22nd, this is the information. Again, two um, emails for Bethany, two emails for Dylan, one email for um, Ethan, three different phone numbers, one for each. So when they do open this on the 22nd, they immediately take it and have it submitted with the court it is submitted um, on the 23rd of August. It is sealed on the 23rd of August. But it is submitted on August 23rd. August 23rd. And then sealed immediately. And the very same day, we have a waiver of speedy trial from our defendant. Hmm. So let's hmm. make it make a little more sense. Isn't that interesting? On July 24th, the day that they heard his alibi, they obtained this warrant for Dylan, Bethany, and Ethan. It needed an extension, but... They got it back on the 22nd. It's the day before he waives his speedy trial. And then the day that it is sub submitted and sealed in court, we receive his waiver of a speedy trial. Now, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. Just hold your horses. Okay. We're looking at um, TikTok information that came back on Dylan Mortensen, the bushy eyebrows girl, Bethany mm -hmm. Funk, who's the I don't want to testify girl. And maybe she I saw exculpatory stuff. Yeah. Right. Exactly. You took the words out of my mouth. And Ethan Chapin, who was Xana's boyfriend. So wait a minute. Hold on. I'm a little bit slow, but all this stuff comes back on August 22nd. And bingo, boom, bo, um, uh, August 23rd, the next day, Mr. Koberger waives his right to a speedy trial. I have a question for you. W wasn't uh, wasn't uh, Brian Koberger's attorney before this saying, oh, you're trying to force us. We're not going to waive the speedy trial. You're trying to force us to waive. And wasn't she really putting up the stoppers and saying, no, you're trying to force us. We're not going to do it. Well, she was. And I have those for us to take a look at as well. No. So let's take a look at a few of the pages from the response to the state's motion to reconsider order staying time for speedy trial. Hmm. So let's take a look at this. Now, I didn't highlight this one, but I can give you some of what was said in this document. Uh, the state's motion is concerned only with Mr. Koberger's statutory right to a speedy trial, though it never makes it plain. To be clear, there is no way to read a partial waiver of constitutional right as a full waiver. Um, the state cites to state versus Lundquist, wherein the court explicitly states that there is nothing wrong with a partial waiver for purposes of constitutional rights. So this entire document pertains to Mr. Koberger um, having the right to a speedy trial. Now in her very last paragraph here, she says, it is particularly ridiculous that the state claims the public 
has some stake in forcing Mr. Koberger to either abandon his constitutional right. Now, this is when they were going back and forth about how the public was just so outraged and they wanted him to just go to trial and get there quickly. It was over the summer. So she says it's particularly ridiculous that the state claims the public has taken some stake in forcing Mr. Koberger to either abandon his constitutional right to defend himself or permit this case to carry on indefinitely as the state wishes. Either the public wants its trial in October or it does not. The state's position on waiver, waiver of speedy trial is its own. If the public is to take any interest in this situation at all, it should be to wonder at the cavalier attitude the government has towards one of the fundamental rights secured to our citizens. Interesting wording. Very interesting wording that she's saying that the government is cavalier. That's a that's a pretty strong charge, I would say. I think so, too. I think she was being very bold about what she was saying here. And this document came out the same day as his alibi. So yeah. let's we're going to go from alibi to waiver of speedy trial. So right. the same day as his alibi, they've already mentioned he's not giving up his speedy trial. Well, then we get the notice of the defendant's alibi response. And the objection to the state's motion to compel or otherwise bar certain evidence. Now, this is where we got a little more than just the alibi offered. And they once again said, you're not going to force us to waive our right to a speedy trial. So I'll show you that here. Hmm. Do I have these backwards? Oh, no, right here. Okay, so not the bottom two lines, but just right above there we see, okay. The state continually uses those opportunities to attempt to force a waiver of speedy trial. That is a decision left to Mr. Koberger and Mr. Koberger alone. So my reading on this document is that, you know, she feels pressured by the prosecution. She feels pressured by Bill Thompson, not to personalize it, but by the, the team of state prosecutors that, and look at the second to the last or the last full paragraph there. The state's motion is an attempt to force the defense to open its work product files and let the state peek inside. The defense has stated all that can firmly be stated at this time. This is not trial by ambush from the defense. This is the defense requesting information as quickly as possible, yet in some instances face the delay of requesting a court order to obtain information. This last sentence, last two sentences, the state continually uses those opportunities to attempt to force a waiver of speedy trial. And she explains, hey, guys, that's a decision that's left to Mr. Kohlberger and Mr. Kohlberger alone. So she feels I'm not going to say threatened. That's too strong of a word, but she feels like they're pushing her to waive the speedy trial Correct. at that point. Now, I want to make a connection here. Yep. They just served the search warrant on Alibi yep. Day, right? I don't know if Ann knows that that search warrant went out yet. I think she may find out once it's returned and like submitted into the court. So... When it was returned on the 22nd, is there something that caused the change in attitude? Well, now, and well, now I'm, I'm largely just a civil attorney, uh, and I, I've looked at the Idaho criminal uh, rules. I've got them on my um, computer here. But when you send out a warrant, when you send out a subpoena, your duty is to send a copy of it to, to the opposing counsel. So my guess, I don't know, because again, I'm not thoroughly familiar with the Idaho rules. My guess is that she would have had to have known that would it have went known. Out. Okay. I would think, yes. And I'm wondering, yes. So then I'm wondering if she knew that there was a possibility that there could have been something there. And it's just that when she got the, when they all got the warrant back, maybe she realized that because something caused her client after all of that diligently saying, I have rights and I'm not going to give them up. Right. It, something caused him to waive his right to a speedy trial. Yep. And I'm just wondering if these things are connected. Um, because before that, he had his head on straight. Before that, um, Brian was kind of saying, listen, if you don't have your ducks in a row to condemn me, 
that's your fault. Right. We're taking this to trial. Right. But the day after this warrant comes back, he's like, okay, if you don't have your ducks in a row, it's fine. Get them in a row. Like, it's the weirdest thing. What caused that change in attitude? Um, so I'm just well, wondering if it came from here. Well, well, wait a minute. All right. So we're jumping ahead now to the day that he, he waived his speedy trial, the day after the results from this search warrant came out. Isn't that what you're saying? Yes. So that wait a minute. Correct. Hold on a second. Um, you know, um, these people are people that use their phones all the time. You know, Dylan, Bethany, uh, Kaylee, Maddie, and I'm not casting aspersions. I'm stating a fact that people of that age use their cell phones all the time. So I don't know. And we have we have a picture of uh, Kaylee or Maddie, you know, taking pictures with their cell phone at the food truck. So yeah. I mean. Is it possible that there is something similar to Paul Murdoch's Snapchat just before the murder of his father on those phones? Maybe somebody was doing a Snapchat or a TikTok or just a video, just a, a straight. You video. know what else? You know what else I just thought about as you were saying what? that, Andrew? What? We don't know that Dylan Mortensen didn't have her phone like in her hand. That's what I'm when saying. She encountered the person. That's what I'm saying. Because think about this. All right. Dylan's up on the second floor. Bethany's down on the first floor. The the two girls, Kaylee and Maddie, are up on the third floor. And the perpetrator is said to have allegedly come in that um, slider in the back on the second floor. Now, that's been said to be an old, creaky house. People that lived in that house before said you could hear people upstairs if you were downstairs and vice versa. It was an old, creaky, wooden house built in the 1960s. And as you saw in our intro, one little bang with the backhoe and the whole thing fell down. So now mm -hmm. they're sitting there, they're sitting there tick-tocking or whatever, and they hear creaking. So they start their phones. I wonder what that is. I wonder what that is. So do they have the creaking and or possibly the beginning of the video of the person coming in? Yeah. Or maybe they got the person like, Okay, so they say that Dylan locked herself in her bedroom after, right? But right. we don't know that Dylan didn't immediately call Bethany, right? Right. And maybe Bethany looked out her window and got something. Maybe. The car. It yes. would have been standing still. It probably would have been a pretty decent image if that's what it would have been. But yeah. I am a little I am a little curious about Ethan, about something else. Because what? more of a like a Paul Murdoch moment. Um, a what? Oh, 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 okay. Yeah. I, I say that because I've always told my fiance, I think it's weird. Um, TikTok is kind of like a thing where you want to hear the things that are going on. Yeah. On videos. So Zana was like laying in bed watching TikTok, probably enjoying herself and laughing. Um, and Ethan was asleep. I've always wondered if he was on TikTok in bed with her. And then here he is on this TikTok warrant, and the next day the defendant waives his right to a speedy trial. Yeah, there's so got to be a reason why they. There's got to be a reason why more powerful in there. I'm sorry. Perhaps I'm sorry. even the person who attacked Ethan, attacking Ethan. There's got to be a big, 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 big reason why uh, Brian Kohlberger, uh, through his counsel, um, went 180 degrees on saying, "Hey, stop pushing us from uh, waiving our speedy trial." Then this um, warrant uh, return comes back and the very next day they flip 180 degrees and say, oh yeah, okay, we'll waive it. I mean, uh, and uh, you remember uh, in the Murdoch trial, well, it's my opinion, but I think it's shared by many, many, many people that that um, Snapchat that Paul Murdoch took down at the kennel, which showed that his father was absolutely there, no doubt at all. Forget about reasonable doubt. That's what croaked him. And he can get all the trials, the retrials he wants, he's croaked. And that's what croaked him. So is there something that's being withheld at this time that we don't know about that, you know, just croaks him? I am really um, wondering, is there something that just condemns him? So keeping in mind that Xana Kronodal was likely awakened on TikTok at approximately 4.12 a.m. And that yep. it was used in the probable cause affidavit and that they didn't have any TikTok warrants back at all yet then. 
that would imply to me that her forensic download told them something. Yeah, so I think I agree. Ethan, Dylan, or Bethany's forensic download also told them something that they didn't even need the TikTok warrant to know. And then they went and got it later as concrete proof of what they know from the phone download, if right. that makes any sense to you guys. Mm -hmm. So our questions today are, do you think that the TikTok warrants will be relevant for any reason? Could someone <laughs> other than Xana Kernodal have been using the TikTok app from approximately 4 to 4.25 a.m. inside of the 1122 King Road home? If so, who do you think it would have been? Could there have been something on TikTok in the account of DM, BF, or Ethan that was so condemning that upon its revelation, the defendant's hand was finally forced? causing him to waive his right to a speedy trial. If so, what sort of information do you think that could have been? I'm sorry. I jumped the gun in, in speculating, you know, five minutes ago, because those are excellent questions that we don't know the, uh, I kind of speculated, but I'm sorry I stole your thunder on that one because those are good questions. No, no. So the, the, the idea is I always talk about what I think after I ask the questions, but hey, Asking the questions first and then posing what you think after, you know? All right. So, what do you think? What are your answers to the questions? So I think, um, I do think that the TikTok warrants are very relevant only because after they came, these specific ones for Dylan, Bethany, and Ethan, because when they came back, the fight, it's like he lost his will to fight. It's like he was defeated. Something in here seems to defeat him. Um. Someone other than Xana, I did say. Now, I don't know anything about Bethany's night, right? So she could have been on TikTok. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm a little, I, I wonder about Dylan. Only because, according to the statement of the PCA, she was awakened yes. at about 4 a.m. So mm -hmm. it would have been something like she pulled out her phone just to see what was going on or get some light or something like that or to purposefully record someone. Um only because she had just been asleep. So it's not like she would have been sitting there with her phone in her hand. Um, I also question Dylan and Bethany um, having been the person to find this or have this revelation. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess the reason why is because I think it's a little weird that you saw someone, you heard some stuff, you knew you needed to pull your phone out. And then you didn't call 911 when things got weird. So, oh, come and, on now. You know that she had a, a, a shock, a frozen shock I, phase. I know. I know. <laughs> some, some, someone please tell me where in the DSMs there's any kind of a diagnosis for a frozen shock phase. But I interrupted your, your train of thought answering these questions. I'm you sorry. You want to know? You want to know what's funny? Yeah, I do want to know what's funny. I need a good laugh right now. <laughs> Can you see him? No, uh -huh. what's all that? A collector, the oh, DSM. You have, there they are, right there. Now, could you, could you, I uh, wow, I'm impressed. Where could in the DSM? Open? I have no idea. Yeah, they're not, I, I, I have an idea. You know, you could stay up until midnight tonight and you're not going to find frozen shock phase. phase. It, ain't, it yeah. ain't in there. I don't know. No. I have no idea. Anyway, so, but um, let's see. So other than Xana, like I said, I think, I don't know anybody, anything about Bethany's night. So honestly, like maybe Bethany didn't even go to sleep. Maybe she was up when this all went down and maybe she was on TikTok, you know? So it could have been Bethany. It could have been Ethan. Um, I do think that because they sought out TikTok warrants um, for everyone, yeah, that, that means something. What do you guys yeah. think? Um, I think there might have been some messaging going on. I'm curious. I wonder, too, if there was the presumption that the victims were alive because maybe they even had sent the TikTok shortly before. And then it's like, oh, you see, they're active. They send you a message and then they're inactive. Yeah. Which, you yeah. know. So that's, that's what I was thinking. Um, mm -hmm. So that answers questions two and three. Um, and then if there was something on the TikTok account, I guess I kind of talked about it already. I'm wondering, did somebody get the car standing still? Maybe they were able to actually get like an image that some, okay. At some point, um, 
They were looking for the 2011 to 2013 and then the 2014 to 2016. And the probable cause affidavit does make it seem like once they got the footage from WSU, they were able to tell that it was a 2014 to 2016 in a more refined manner. Um, but I'm actually just wondering if maybe one of the girls or unfortunately one of the victims who was on the second floor may have been able to catch the vehicle or the attacker. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I don't know about the car. I really don't know about the car because from what I've seen, speculation, he didn't park in the front. He parked up the hill in the back. So that's what I thought too. But I do keep hearing a lot that there's... Okay. Um, we don't know. That, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I know. But, you know, mainstream media and so My far... My only thought with the car, and I'm sorry to kind of interrupt you. I just want to say like... I only pay attention to the cars outside my house now because I've been broken into in the past. I feel like if they had saw the car, I question the likelihood that they would have taken a picture of it. Because even if there was a suspicious car in their line of sight, unless they had a big reason to be suspicious of it in that moment, I feel like they might disregard it if so, they feel safe in the time. So here's my my two things, okay? All right. So they parked behind the house and they're they're behind the house, right? Then it could have been DM. Mm. Okay. The back of the house in that back parking lot, you can yeah. see those things. So it could have been DM that would have maybe caught the car parked behind the house. If it was in front of the house, it could have been BF that caught the car parked in front of the house. Right. Right. Um, if it was Ethan, um, there are things that people do as a last ditch effort, but I'm wondering if it was just like something that was, he wasn't actually even planning for. He maybe didn't pull his phone out thinking, oh my God, let me record this attacker. But he already had his phone out when the attacker attacked him. You know, it and it really gets you to wondering because Mr. Murdoch didn't know his son was recording. No. And no, that's know. not something that, that's not something that attackers even think about in their mind is that girl on a live right now? And I'm going to snatch her live in front of thousands of people. That's not something that people think about. That's so because of that, right. So because of that, I just don't know if I don't know which one of them it could have been, but I can see how it could play out that anyone, depending on where he parked, um, depending on whether or not. So if she heard crying and that's what led her to go to her door and then she heard that man say, it's okay, I'm going to help you. And then the crying stopped. Maybe she went back into her room and grabbed her phone. Maybe when she came back out that last time and saw the man, she had her phone in her hand already. Maybe she was going to call 911, right? Then she sees the man and goes into frozen shock phase. No call to 911 now. But maybe she went back and got her phone because the thing she was hearing alarmed her. And maybe in some way she did capture something. There are people who believe that maybe one of the girls captured something, um, either coming in or someone coming in or going out of the house. Um, but now this warrant makes it look like there's a chance they may have. And if not, it makes it look like there's a chance that Ethan may have had something very important on his phone. Yeah, well, one of these me, players. Yeah. Count me as one of those people that thinks that there's something on those phones because there had to be something that changed Brian Koberger's mind so quickly. Uh, August uh, 23rd, August 24th, when this uh, material came in and then he uh, suddenly waived his right to a speedy trial. And count me in uh, one of the, those people that think that there's something on the phones. You talked about video. OK, maybe it's video as long as we're just talking. Uh, maybe it's audio like the um, the uh, Paul Murdoch Snapchat. There was no video. The video was pointed down at the dog's tail. They were talking about, you know, there's something wrong with the dog. Should we take it to the vet? But it was the audio that that sank um, Paul Murdoch. I'm sorry, sank Alex Murdoch because it was his voice on this. I'm just wondering if somebody mm -hmm. picked up a cell phone and picked up a voice of of somebody you know, after they said, I'm here to help you, you know, maybe they came in the room and there was a cell phone. I don't know. I'm speculating. But, you know, with four, six young people in that house, you know, always using their cell phones for this and that and taking pictures even out of the grub truck. 
I think there's a really high likelihood that there's at least some audio, maybe as you guys have said a video, but there's something on those phones. There's something a that we don't know. A picture, even if it's I not know. video, yeah. just a single picture. Um, picture. Cause like the video, you know, it seems like a little bit more effort and the time and the, the flash right, may right. come on, you know, you never really right. know, but like the picture, um, right. the bushy. So, so basically here's one for you. Let me run this by you. What do you think of this? Dylan said she saw the man in the black with the mask and the bushy eyebrows. And um, what if she was able to snap a pic of him, right? And now they have a picture of him to compare to the driver's license photo. And even though half of his face is covered, you'd still be able to see something to compare to the driver's license photo. Don't so you maybe, think? Maybe I follow that. you. I follow you. And you may well be right. You may well be right. But at the same time, don't you think if there was a smoking gun like that, and that'd be huge, that'd be really huge. Don't you think we would know about it by now? See, I hope that we would. Um, but I wonder if that would jeopardize his right to a impartial and fair trial. And maybe that's why we wouldn't. Well, um, because if they told me that they had the picture and then I see the picture and I see the metadata that shows what time it was taken. And I hear from the witness that she heard scary things and saw a scary thing in her house at the same time that the metadata shows me the picture of the man that she said she saw. I don't know. Well, but uh, Lainey and I are working on an episode right now and it's only it's it's halfway done. We're not done with it yet. Uh, on a trial that's going on in New Hampshire right now. And Court TV is covering it live, the trial of Timothy Merrill. And what happened was in the first trial of Mr. Merrill back in 2019, uh, Verrill with a V, uh, halfway through the trial, it was revealed that the police had not disclosed very exculpatory information. There were disks, there were documents, there were statements by... Um, witnesses there was an allegation that maybe someone else had uh, taken out a contract on the the poor victims lives and this trial was stopped right in the middle of the trial there were two days of hearings because the police withheld evidence uh, there were two days of hearings and after the hearings in the middle of this trial uh, had it been going on for some time there was a mistrial. It went up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, well, all right, we're not going to dismiss the, 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 the case, but we're going to order the prosecutors to retry the case. So I would suggest strongly that it's very dangerous for the prosecution, if they have something like this, to hold it so close to the vest until the trial, because the same thing could happen. And we'll be dropping that episode uh, pretty soon. But I, if there's such a smoking gun, why don't we know about it? I'm wondering if everyone else does except for us. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm wondering if we're the know, only people who don't know. We did, a, we did an episode a couple of weeks ago where we talked about a case in Massachusetts in which there were four trials. Four, count them, one, two, three, four, because some things were done in trials one and two. Then trial three was a mistrial, a hung jury. Then trial four came around. There were seven appeals. <laughs> and meanwhile, the parents of this poor 15-year-old girl who was gone are just, you know, wringing their hands, not knowing what's going on. Took that case four trials and seven appeals in Massachusetts. And if you didn't see that episode, the citation is Commonwealth of Massachusetts against James Cater. And I hate to say this, but it, it, if they're withholding evidence and they're not disclosing material in discovery and Ann Taylor is forced to do 13 uh, uh, discovery requests and four motions to compel, I see this case going down that track. I'm sorry, but that's what I see. I do as well. Um, I think that uh, her mentioning prosecutorial misconduct very early on, her mentioning um, exculpatory evidence, I think the revelation of the Brady and the Giglio very early on, um, and then all 13, and I'm sure there's 13 more coming, discovery. Oh, gosh. So, somebody corrected me. I, I said I'd never heard of a trial in which there were 13 rounds of discovery. And somebody in our comments section corrected me and said in one of her other cases, I forget whether they said there were 17. I think they said, so it's like, I was wrong. There were more than seven, than 13. So, Oh, well, this one's going to 
blow that out the water. I feel yeah. like, and then, uh, and then it's like, um, you know, there's, there's certain things that, you know, we know that they can and cannot have going on. You know, you can't hold her this discovery. She shouldn't have to request no. the same no. exact. So especially if this, if she's requesting the same things, you know what I mean? The same things from request number three, now in yeah. request number 13, you know, yeah. you can't do that. You know, and the, there the are motion, things. And motion number four to compel has now been set up for a hearing, but it's not until May. It's not until yeah. May. I mean, that's, I don't know. I, we, we, we dropped an episode in which we talked about a discovery master bringing someone else in besides the, because the court's busy. All right. This is a general um, jurisdiction, subject matter court. They hear, you know, they hear personal injury cases, slip and falls, car accidents, uh, criminal matters, contract disputes. A guy comes to your house uh, to build a deck and he screws it up and disappears with the money. This court is trying all of those cases. So my suggestion is bring in a discovery master, someone that everybody agrees on, and they spend the time that, you know, the court frankly doesn't have when they're handling all these other cases. Have the discovery master come in, sit the parties down and say, all right, really? 51 terabytes? Really? And we're going to talk about that in another episode. But I mean, it just seems to me that the, the cases... And again, I have to be really careful what I say. I really do. But the, the management of the discovery could be a little bit more focused is the best way I can say it. Very much. Very <laughs> much. And I also think that the, the on Anne's end, um, the going through the, the discovery, and I, I mean, hire another person you know, if you have to. Figure it out. In, like, it needs to be gone through. And at... Mm -hmm. At one, okay, so just one terabyte being 500 hours of video, that's multiple weeks of video, right? Yep. So then you multiply that by the 51 and you get to like nearly a freaking half a year of video, you know? And I mean, that's obviously translating it all into video. But the point here is that when you have smaller files like pictures and how long did it take you to go through those if it would take you half a year to look at it if it was all in video form, you know? So it just, and then you have to put the pieces and the parts together. And I understand that, but there's, there's just something about not just uh, having your client's alibi, just find exactly. it. Exactly. That yeah. is yeah. the, um, that's the actual thing that changes everything here. You yeah. don't go to trial if you find your client's alibi. There's no mitigation. Uh, the idea that your your client has an alibi that you might be able to find, and yet you're paying a mitigation specialist is insane. Well, um, she has to pay the mitigation person because well, that's that's bar association does. standards. Yeah. Well, now she does. Now she does. Before June 26th of 2023, this was not a death penalty case. Right. And because of that, for the first six months, she had no reason to be paying a mitigation specialist. Well, I'm going to disagree with you about one something. We get along great and I love all your work and we get along fantastically, but we don't always agree. And here's one of the places where I'm not going to agree with you. And I know I'm going out on a limb with some other attorneys. Ask me if I care. Um, the alibi doesn't necessarily stop everything, even if and I don't think there will be, but even if he has witnesses to back up his alibi, credibility is always, 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 always an issue. So suppose you do <laughs> get, suppose you do get witnesses that say he wasn't there. He was over here at the Dairy Queen getting a blizzard. Okay. We want to put you on the stand at trial and, and find out your credibility. Oh, Brian bought you the blizzard and he bought you five of them the week. before. So Alibi does not necessarily stop the trial. D d now, yeah, I'm going. I'm going to go one step further and say this. Yeah. That's yeah. true. That's true in the situation that you're putting it in. But yeah. what if his alibi is not a person? What if his alibi is physically being at a place like a gas station? What if his alibi is he's on camera somewhere else? You can clearly see him, no mask, not wearing black, and it's the time of the crimes. What if that's his alibi? Because credibility. If you call me, credibility. If you call me, 
Yeah. If you call me as a witness, I am yeah. going to try and have that quashed. If I don't have to come in because there's video footage that already proves this, because right. now you're asking me to come in as a witness when the footage already proves it there. And I feel like my lawyer may have a good idea of putting it together as well. Now you're starting to put too much information into this basket. How many witnesses? So for example, when Anne says she has 400 witnesses in the innocence phase. No, no. no. Well, wait a minute. But if you, even if you did, Anne, how many of those witnesses that are going to say the same exact thing, do you think the right. judge is really going to let you bring in five, four, three? Exactly. It's going to be, it's right. going to be less than a handful. And that's what I mean. So if you already have the footage that shows him somewhere else, do you really need me, the person who was at the gas pump? Nope, because you can uh, probably use the gas station clerk. That's what I I'm don't saying. trust. I, I, I still I dispute every word that you're saying because I don't trust electronic gizmos. So what? So what? He has a he has a uh, he has a, a video from the gas station that shows that he's there pumping gas at that time. Well, those numbers are subject. You know, when you buy a new uh, electronic gizmo, you set the time so you can change the time. Plus, they're also they're fuzzy. I know there are some very good YouTubers that I am not going to disparage because they've done some great work with these linda lane videos it's fuzzy it's fuzzy math i feel like george bush I, it's fuzzy i so love watching those credibility things so that, that just because he might have a video of him off calivanting at the beach in acapulco credibility of that electronic evidence is always an issue so no i'm sorry <laughs> okay so i want to well, back I do, up i, I, I do back. agree that it is there is an issue with credibility i'm just saying that when the video footage backs up my witness occurrence, there's a diminished issue with my credibility. If mm. I, as the witness say, well, I looked at my phone and it said 1135. And then you look at the video and the video also says 1135. And I've never seen the security footage before. I'm just the person who was at the gas station pump. And I was like, I looked at my phone, it was 1135. Now the metadata from the video matches. It sounds like that's making me more credible. Very what think, credible. What do you think are the chances of that happening in this trial? Well, here's the thing. So when my house was broken into, um, I didn't know someone was in my home. But oh, I knew exactly what yeah. time he had been in my home um, because I had gone to use the bathroom and come back into my room. There was a clock on the wall outside of my room. I did check what time it was. And as I looked at the clock, I noticed that my um, floodlight on the side of my house went off and it only goes off if there's someone there. So well, I have a great deal of compassion. On, I have a lot of compassion for you and I feel horrible about what happened to you. And I, I don't want to make light of that situation because that's a horrible situation. So let's take that and put it over here and get back to this trial. And uh, I don't trust electronic stuff. I mean, look how many times we tried to do this podcast and the stuff broke and didn't work and it went. Eh, eh, eh. So, no, I don't trust electronic stuff. Clocks don't always work. The batteries run down on my clock in the kitchen all the time. People can fudge the settings. The the video is, well, also is fuzzy. It had, just so been, credibility. it had also just been daylight savings. So someone's video footage camera may their their camera video footage may not reflect the right time because maybe they didn't mm -hmm. update it. It had just been daylight savings. So if it's a camera that doesn't naturally update itself, if it's not set like that, if it doesn't have that ability, then it wouldn't be right to begin with. It would likely be wrong unless you went in and manu manually changed it. Daylight savings had just occurred when this attack occurred. So there's that. Um, yeah. It gave Wait everyone like five days to go in and switch their camera times and stuff like that. So there, there are chances that times could be off as well. I mean, I've been involved in civil litigation where somebody slipped and fell or had a car accident. And, you know, now, yeah, there are photographs, uh, there are security videos and I get them. I, you know, I asked the insurance company, you know, send me the, the pictures and sometimes they have the metadata. Sometimes they don't have the metadata. And if they don't, we have to send out supplemental discovery. Here I am, you know, mimicking Ann Taylor. But then we get it in the metadata. The times might be different. One one camera says uh, the, the person went into the big box store at 213. The next one says they went in at 518. So, no, I don't trust that electronic stuff. I really don't. 
I want to get back to uh, the terabytes. I want to get back to the terabytes and point out that uh, you're absolutely right about uh, the fact that one terabyte is, you know, half a year of video. So 50 terabytes, good grief. I mean, so here's, I, I hate it when people say, and then our next episode, but <laughs> I have a challenge to Laney, our electronic person. And I'm saying to people, I get these salesmen all the time calling my office. Oh, we're going to sell you, you know, artificial intelligence. AI is the solution for your law firm, Mr. Myers. AI is going to do this and that and make the coffee. And, you know, so my challenge to Laney, and I, as you and I are not agreeing here, I don't think Laney and I are going to totally agree on this issue. <laughs> Why can't AI be brought in and uh, helped through these 51 terabytes? And we're not going to answer it now, right? <laughs> I will give a little spoiler and say that for those looking forward to our video on AI solving the information crisis and how much information we have, maybe AI would be able to determine what clocks are set wrong in the mm. information too. I mean, mm. uh, this just is a little teaser, but AI is very good at finding inconsistencies and pointing out where they might have originated. So if we did theoretically have a bunch mm. of cameras with a bunch of different times, mm. AI could probably figure out what time the event happened. Are you trying to are you trying to tell us that the computers are smarter than the people involved in this case? I didn't say, you that. know, I'm just putting it out there. I use a calculator <laughs> when I'm doing my math. Uh, I'm not going to say that I know better than the calculator. <laughs> okay. Let's do our final thoughts. Final thoughts. Forensic. What are your final thoughts today? So my final thoughts are, there are many, many coincidences, many dates, many reactionary things, many things that seem to have been done in an incendiary fashion. Um, and I'm kind of wondering if there's a chance that Brian waiving his right to a speedy trial was a result of um, something that had happened the month before, the warrant going out for Dylan, Bethany, and Ethan. My final thoughts are that I truly hope hope we find out soon what it is that they might be hiding and stowing away because everything seems like something that they might be hiding and stowing away. It's not just, yeah, it my, doesn't just feel like one thing. It feels like there's so many things. No, I think you're right. And my final thought is uh, that you may well be right about that. And if you are, I hate the word bombshell. You know, these people that tell us how to do our YouTubes and, you know, get more clicks, use words like bombshell. No, but if there is something like the um, Paul Murdoch Snapchat, that would, in fact, be huge. And that's yes. my closing thought. Lainey, it's your turn. I think that Forensic Frenzy did an excellent job at pointing out what's going on with TikTok. I, it led me, like, I don't know if anybody noticed halfway through, I'm, like, looking through my phone to see if I can send picture messages in TikTok. I didn't see it, but that's still a possibility because... Like Snapchat, you take a picture and it might be a message that you can't find publicly. So I think you definitely made us think of a lot of things that weren't previously considered. And I think, as always, you do such a great job with your work. So thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you for having me, guys. Thanks so much, Andrew. Good to see you, Forensic. It Good was to see nice. You, <laughs> Good to well. see you, Andrew. No, thank you guys so we much for watching our video. You. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And definitely, everybody, please be sure to subscribe to Forensic Frenzy on her channel, like all her videos, watch all her videos, uh, become a member. <laughs> but thank you guys so much. So like, comment, and subscribe on our channel. And let us know, do you think that TikTok warrants will be relevant? Let us know your answers to the questions down in the comments below. Thank you, guys. You have been watching About the Law, a production of the law offices of Andrew D. Myers in Methuen in the Merrimack Valley of Massachusetts and in Derry, just outside of Manchester, New Hampshire. Remember to click the like and subscribe buttons down below. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to share it with your friends and others. If you'd like to talk to me about an injury case, a car accident, a slip and fall, a serious bodily injury case, or some other case, please feel free to contact me. I'd love to talk to you. 
You can contact us through my website at attorney-myers.com. We have a contact us block, or you can call on one of the telephone numbers we've given there, or you can email me at andrew at attorney-myers.com. The foregoing is offered for informational purposes only. It is not intended as and does not constitute legal advice. Laws vary widely from state to state. You should rely only on the advice given to you during a personal consultation by a local attorney thoroughly familiar with state laws and the area of practice in which your concern lies. This podcast must be and hereby is labeled advertisement in some jurisdictions. Maybe there's tunnels. She, I think she went down into one of the tunnels. She's not. Oh, you're, you're, She's you're, you're, tunnel. you're a, yeah, you're a very, tunnels. you're a very serious person. You're not, you know, uh, acquainted with our after the show features in which we ask the serious question: Are there tunnels? No, I've actually. You guys have no idea. You got me in trouble with that. How do we get you in trouble? How do we get you in trouble? Oh, Come on. How do we get you in trouble? <laughs> Find because that the, the next first time one. you guys said that to me, I laughed. And I'm pretty sure that the tunnels person went back and got upset and spread a rumor that I was FBI. And then no. I had people in my comments, like attacking me for being the FBI. I'm not kidding. I'm serious. I didn't yeah, know that. that's flattery. I <laughs> had to block like dozens of people <laughs> who were like, said you're the FBI. And like, they're, they're literally coming to my comments and they're like, this girl is spreading misinformation. She works with them. She's the FBI. It was, like, it was just, it was just awful. It was just awful. My, my freaking followers, my subscribers are in there. They're like, she already told us who she was. And she's, she literally said, she's not a big deal. Like you guys are giving her way more credit than she ever gave herself. <laughs>